I was raised in a message church my whole life and grew up in an incredible home with the best parents I could have asked for. I had so much love and support growing up. We attended church every Saturday and Sunday since I could remember. My grandmother was a wonderful, godly pillar in our church and the sister of Brother Homer Frazier. I have many fond memories of praying beside her in the mornings before I got on the bus and in the evenings when I was waiting for my parents to get home from work. I spent a lot of time with her and we were extremely close. When I was 15, my granny passed away and I had a really difficult time. At the time, I was attending a public high school and was already struggling with the pressures of trying to fit in. So when I lost my granny, I really struggled mentally and depression began to creep in. I became very insecure with myself and started seeking comfort in anything but God. I became very uninterested in church and tried to avoid going. Every time I would attend church, I felt like I was being preached on, but failed to recognize it was just God working through the ministry to remind me of who I really was, his daughter and his bride. I wasn't drinking, smoking, or partying, but I was grasping to all the entertainment the world had to offer and believing the lie that I was not good enough. I tried to find comfort in unholy music, by changing the way I looked, by dyeing my hair and using lots of makeup, and the list goes on and on. I thought these things would make me love myself more and would bring me peace, but in reality, I was still just as broken. Fast forward to 2012, after I graduated high school. I started college in the fall to be a teacher. After a couple semesters and struggling with my mental health, I decided to take a break from school. I was going to church, but I was still living for the world, and I was still searching to find validation from people and things that held no eternal value. I still desperately needed God to mend my mental health, and I needed to have a personal experience with Elohim. My parents were praying for me that I would find my way back to the Word, and during this same stretch of time, I ended up taking a trip to New York City with a few friends that I had met out in the world. My mom begged me not to go, and my pastor, Brother Ron, had even called me before I left to convince me not to go. Being stubborn, I still went on the trip. And while I was walking the streets in Times Square, New York, I stopped and looked up at all the lights, and I felt a warm presence that I had never felt before. It was the oddest feeling, but it was so peaceful. Something told me to check the time, and when I looked, I realized that it was Saturday night and church was probably just ending back home. To be honest, I had purposely not been communicating with anyone back home while on this trip, because again, I was trying to run away from the Lord and all those that stood for Him. But there was something about that warm feeling I had just experienced that I couldn't shake, and I decided to call my mom to check in. And while talking to my mom, I asked about how church had been. She said it had been an awesome service. Because of the warm presence I had felt, I had a huge, strong urge to ask her if anything had happened. She ended up telling me that Brother Ron had came to her and prayed f- and prayed specifically for me. He told her that I was going to be okay and that God could meet me on the streets of New York. I immediately responded with, I just felt him a few minutes ago while we were walking through the streets of Times Square. I felt him come to me. I knew at that moment that God was calling me back home. I had a few special moments with God at church when I returned home, but none that really changed me. I was living a better life and trying to make changes, but was still failing, and I still needed the Holy Ghost to keep me. It was a couple months after that experience in New York that we had a prayer line in church. And when I got to where the ministers were, Brother Ron looks me in the eyes. And when he spoke, it was his voice, but it was not him speaking. I heard these words. I've watched you run and run and run away from me, but I never left you. It's time to stop running. I chose to stop running that night and started serving God to the best of my abilities. 
and knew, though, that I still needed the Holy Ghost. A few months after that prayer line, I had a special moment with Brother Ron, where he looked at me and said, you need to go back to school and finish getting your degree. I had learned to listen to Ron's advice, and a few days later, I signed up for classes in the fall. I ended up going back to school, and in 2018, I graduated and got a teaching job. After teaching for a year, I really started to desire my own family. I was still struggling mentally with insecurities and with being worthy. I was closer to God than I had ever been, but I was still struggling to know my worth. In October 2019, Brother Andrew preached a sermon called, This is Where I Belong. I felt the Spirit of the Lord tugging on me the entire service. I knew tonight was going to be special. As Andrew finished his sermon, he reminded us that Goliath was drugged through the streets and that we could celebrate the defeat of our enemy as well. And when he said that, many in the church took that into action and began to walk around the church. Some were even running, professing that their enemy was defeated. I was one of those people confessing, and I was confessing that doubt, fear, and insecurity was defeated, and that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Once I was done walking to the church, I stopped at the altar, and after Andrew was finished with his sermon, he came to pray with me, and he said to me, Sarah, you are exactly where you are supposed to be. He told me not to let the enemy convince me otherwise. I felt an overwhelming sense of relief and had not cried out to God like that ever before. That moment was very significant for me, and I knew since those things I had been battling had left that the Lord was about to do something very special in my life and that he was going to provide the husband and family that I had been praying for. Backing up to a year before in 2018, I had written on a sticky note everything that I wanted in a husband. I tucked that note in my Bible. It seemed like an impossible fairy tale list, but I knew God could do big things. Two years after writing that note, my husband Gabriel came into the picture. He had just given his heart to the Lord and recently had moved to live with his uncle, Brother Ron, when we started talking. We had known each other our whole lives, but had never had a serious conversation. Listen to his testimony to hear more about how God revealed to him that we were going to get married long before he was even fully serving the Lord. This portion of our testimony is proof that God cares about the details and his timing is always perfect. Gabriel checked every single box that I had written on that sticky note. No matter how much of a fairy tale it seemed, he became my fairy tale. There is a lot I could say about how and when Gabriel and I started dating and how God had his hand in all of it, but I will fast forward to when we got engaged. After Gabriel asked me to marry him, I found out Gabriel and our families had organized a dinner to celebrate. As we were all eating, everyone was already curious about the details about when the wedding would be and whatnot. My sweet friend Whitney said to me, where do you think you would like to have the ceremony? And I responded with, well, since I was a teenager, I've always seen myself getting married under a large tree in the middle of a field. I had had a dream about this in my early teen years, and it just stuck with me. Whitney immediately responded with, Stephanie has a huge, beautiful tree in her yard. She texted Stephanie right then, and she ended up sending us pictures. We immediately fell in love with the pictures, and Stephanie and her husband, Jerry, agreed to allow us to have our ceremony under that tree. It wasn't until a few months later in a prayer line it was revealed to Stephanie and Jerry that the angel of the Lord stands under that tree to watch over their family. This makes me emotional every time I talk about it. Because it may not seem like a big deal to many, but God orchestrates all things. He cares about the little details. He gave me that dream in my teenage years. He provided my sweet friend Stephanie with a gorgeous piece of land. 
and then fulfills that dream years later while revealing that the tree is not only special, but it is supernaturally special. The presence of God was so very near during our wedding, and it was the best day of my life apart from salvation. Life moved pretty quickly for us after we were married. God was opening and closing doors so quickly that we were overwhelmed by his goodness. God provided Gabriel with a brand new job with great hours so that he could be in church every weekend. God provided me with another teaching position that was now only 15 minutes from our house rather than the 45 that I was driving before. As we were thinking about building our new home, I desired to live close to my parents and was praying that the Lord would open that door for us. One day, Gabriel felt led of the Lord to ask my parents' next-door neighbor if he would be willing to sell the wooded property in between their houses. This land was not even listed for sale. My parents' neighbor had never met Gabriel, but agreed to sell us the land. Talk about a miracle. Not only did the Lord allow me to live near my mom and dad, but he allowed us to become their next-door neighbor. Let me tell you about my Jesus. We moved into our newly built home on our one year anniversary, November 6th, the exact date that we got married. Another example of how God's timing is perfect. And a few weeks later, we found out we were expecting our precious Uriah Judah. The month before in October, we were at Brother Tim's meeting and we were praying for a child so that was yet another answered prayer of ours at our gender reveal in march 2023 we had been thinking that i was carrying a baby girl we had her name picked out and everything i had even started looking at nursery designs for little girls only whitney knew the gender at the time we hadn't even found out. We had everyone guess the gender by wearing a sticker at the party. Andrew wouldn't tell anyone his guess or show the sticker that he had chosen because he said the Lord had already showed the gender to him. He didn't provide any details other than that. After the blue balloons fell and we found out we were having a little boy, Andrew showed us the blue sticker that he had hidden under his jacket. After service one night, the Lord had shown Andrew a vision of me holding our baby boy in my arms. The Lord had told Andrew that the baby was going to be all right. We were amazed and humbled that the Lord would care enough about us to show brother Andrew that vision. My pregnancy was wonderful. I wasn't sick and I felt great most of the time, but Around five months, I started swelling pretty bad, but my doctors all said that that was normal and that my blood pressure was within range every time I had a checkup. My friends at work and my family were concerned about my swelling and kept telling me to keep an eye on it. At about seven and a half months of pregnancy, I began to have headaches and I was very tired. I would check my blood pressure regularly, and it was higher than pre-pregnancy, but still not in the concerning range. We had our final ultrasound, and it revealed that Uriah was measuring smaller than the average baby. They explained that there were a few reasons this could be happening, and one of those reasons was that my placenta could be malfunctioning, and that was causing growth restrictions for Uriah. They just told me that they would keep an eye on this in the coming weeks, and if need be, they would then start talking about inducing me. This news, of course, worried me a bit, because up until then, Uriah's measurements had all been normal. This appointment was on Tuesday, and then on that Friday, June 23rd, we attended a wedding for our friends, and I was very tired that day and had a headache. The next day, I had another bad headache, and after church that Saturday evening, my vision was slightly blurry and I felt pretty weak. Gabriel had me check my blood pressure, and the numbers were very alarming. We called the hospital, and they told us to come to the labor and delivery floor immediately. I assumed on the way to the hospital 
that they would put me on a blood pressure medicine since I wasn't due for another five weeks or so. And when we arrived to the hospital, they did some blood work and a urine sample. We waited for a few hours for the results, and then the nurse came in to say, we were keeping you here because the protein in your urine is over six times the normal level, and this indicates preeclampsia. She then told us that I would be induced in the next few minutes and that our baby would be delivered within the next day or so. My midwife came in and told me that this induction was necessary for the safety of me and the baby, but that they were more concerned because my placenta was in fact malfunctioning and was working against me and Uriah. He was not receiving the nutrients that he needed. This news, of course, was very unexpected and I was very worried. Gabriel asked me if I needed anything, and in tears, I responded with, I just need God to hug me. In that moment, God allowed me to remember what the Lord had shown him and the fact that he had said that the baby was going to be all right. Up until then, we hadn't really known what that statement was about. But this brought so much comfort and peace to me about the whole situation. And I knew that this had to be what the Lord meant. Since our boy was only 35 weeks at the time of the induction, I was given a steroid to help inflate his lungs. The labor and delivery was very quick, and Uriah Judah was born on Sunday, June 25th, 2023. He made his appearance while the song, Sea of Victory, was playing. And my goodness, if he only knew how much he has lived up to that song. And how much he's lived up to his name. Uriah means God is my light. And is also the name of a mighty warrior in King David's army. Judah means praise. And our little boy adores church and worship music. He listens to worship music every night when he sleeps and immediately calms down when we play it. It's the most pure and beautiful thing to watch. Before he was born, when certain worship songs were sang in church, I could feel him responding with kicks and spins in the womb. Many don't know this, but two months after sweet baby Uriah was born, we took him to his regular pediatrician because he had developed a large abscess on his lower body overnight. Our pediatrician was immediately concerned since Uriah was so little and he had not seen anything like that in a baby so little. He told us that we needed to go home and pack our bags because he was sending us to the pediatric surgeon at the UVA. He was con confident that we would have to stay overnight and that Uriah was going to be required to have surgery to remove the abscess. When we arrived at UVA, we were seen very quickly and after examining Uriah, the pediatric surgeon determined that the abscess could just be lanced and no surgery would be necessary. We immediately were praising God for this wonderful news. The procedure was done in less than a half an hour and we were back on our way home. The surgeon warned us that because of the location of the abscess, this could be something that could reoccur and that if that were to happen, that he would have to perform surgery to correct the issue internally. We immediately claimed that this would not be the case for our little warrior and I am very happy to report that he hasn't had any other issues since. Praise the Lord. My deacon standing right there beside that door. Before that little baby was in his arms, the Lord showed me a vision of Sarah holding that little boy. They thought it was going to be a girl, but the vision I'd already said it was going to be a boy. Satan tried to block that little boy from getting here, caused all kinds of interruptions. But Uriah is named rightly because he wore it through. He didn't stop in. He didn't stop in. Let me tell you, when did God ever change? When did God ever change? There are many other special moments and confirmations that the Lord has provided throughout our journey. But above all, the most important and precious thing that he has given me and my family is the Holy Ghost. My husband and I 
have both chosen to pursue God together, to stand for this message, and to trust in his promises. And the gracious Lord has proven his faithfulness every single time. With God as your partner, you better have big plans. My God can do exceedingly above all that you can ask or imagine. And whether you are looking for an answer to a job situation, praying for your future mate, desiring a child, or need healing in your body, my God provides. Whether you are seeking more of him, currently running from his presence and calling for your life, or you're hopeless on the streets of New York City, my God knows just how and where to find you. If you trust him, he will use your life to testify of his goodness. I encourage you to testify of what the Lord has done in your life. You are a miracle.